Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. Today we continue with dimensionality reduction. However, we now go beyond these classical methods which are like 100 years old and now look at very recent methods where very recent here means like they are now I think already 20 years old. And they kind of like 20 years ago, I think in the year 2000, ISOMAP and LLE was published and they were like starting again, like a lot of interest in these kind of dimensionality reduction methods. And we will learn all about it today. Of course, using our super advanced matrix notation. And I hope from after a while you will appreciate it. Um, so the presentation that I give you here of these methods, they I'm using my notation with using lots of matrices. When you look often into the papers or into other description, they are very different. So this is, I think, kind of orthogonal to what you read in other sources, typically. In particular, the sources on multidimensional scalings, they are typically writing it for every vector and with lots of indexing. And I try to translate it into a matrix notation. And I think sometimes then things get very clear when you do this. Okay, we've seen this slide already many times. We are still down in, in kind of in, in the section on nonlinear dimensionality reduction. However, today is section 13 and we look at nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So as I said, dimensionality reduction is the task of having a cloud of points in some high dimensional space and you're looking for a low dimensional representation. And ideally it's much lower dimensional than the high dimensional data. This is a very general problem in um, in machine learning, right? In particular, when you hear now the word representation, there's a whole, the whole topic of representation learning is like a very important topic right now, also in deep learning, yeah? Where the question is, what is a good representation? So what information do we want to keep about the data? And so we discussed it already that, for example, good choice is that we want to keep the variance of the data. So that's like a very classical choice that you say, I, I want to have the same spread and I just want to rotate the data kind of into the relevant dimensions. Um, there are others that like neighborhood relationships. So basically, if you are a point in this point cloud and you have a certain neighborhood, so you have some friends around you, you want, you're looking for an embedding where also your friends are again close to you. And that is a neighborhood embedding. And those is, that is basically what the methods that we look at today are doing. And now how does this become something nonlinear? Um, let me show you on the board. So for example, um, you have like a point cloud which looks like this, this half circle or something. And there you also might have a certain neighborhood of this guy. And so he has these two friends, right? And so after I'm embedding this into another space, then I mean, let's call this guy Bob. Yeah, so Bob is now here and Bob wants to sit next to his friends, right? But kind of we change kind of this, this curvature of the space. So here it was like a curved manifold and here we kind of uncurve the thing, okay? So who are the friends? So that's of course Alice and let's say, um, what's, the, what's another, Kim? So it's Alice and Kim. So they, are, they still want to be next to Bob and close by, okay? So that is also a reasonable assumption um, that we want to have embeddings where kind of the neighborhood relationship stays the same. However, there are many more. And when you now uh, start researching about representation learning and deep learning, then that's a super big topic where a representation could be good for classification or it could be good for ca catching causal relationships between variables. Or it could be good by having different variables that are like statistically independent of each other. So you can ask for many properties that you want to have from your representation. And it's a really interesting topic. So this is more like a classical view on it, where classical here now means 20 years old. Okay, so not super old. So when we maximize the variance, we've seen that linear dimensionality reduction is something useful. So basically looking for some linear subspace where we would project the data on. Okay, which could be a line or a hyperplane. So that means in a, in a linear subspace, like for this data set, nothing would change, right? So we have two coordinates and basically in both coordinates, there's a certain variance, right? Since the data is spread out in 2D. However, when we look at it, actually we see that there's a one dimensional space, but, we can, but the one dimensional space is curved. So we cannot um, catch it with a linear method. So for that, we need some nonlinear method, okay? So 
And then typically we talk about curved subspaces or maybe we use the word manifold, for example. Okay. And basically we are searching for, uh, for a curved plane or curved sheet of paper in a high dimensional space. And in principle, if you are in four dimensions, also a 3D space could be curved inside a four dimensional space and so on and so forth. But it's kind of hard to imagine. Um, so the word manifold actually is from mathematics and the word manifold means that you have some object in a higher dimensional space, which is like inherently lower dimensional. But what does it now mean? It kind of means that if you take a point on such a subset of the higher dimensional space and locally it looks like a Euclidean space. So locally it looks like a linear space, right? So this is the example with the, with the, with, with a rolled piece of paper, for example. Oh, you can't see it very well. Let me make it bigger. So you have something, so this is now, this would be a curved space, but when I'm standing right here in a certain neighborhood, I'm in a linear space. So it's kind of flat, locally linear. And so the mathematical description of a manifold is typically that you say at every point of the set, I'm having locally, I'm having like a map, which is like looking like a tangent space or something. And then by connecting all these tangent spaces together, I get a manifold. However, you can also get something weird, like, like a connected manifold, which looks like this. So where the whole thing cannot be embedded into a two dimensional space because you would have to cut it. Okay. So typically these kind of methods, they don't cut the data, right? That's why I left it open over here so I can open it reasonably. Yeah. But in principle, one could also think about methods that would do that, right? I mean, in this case now I'm having something circular. And I cannot really cut it like this because then I would violate the neighborhood relationships down here. However, I could find a parameterization with uh, whatever, with an angle or something. So if I would infer an angle from um, zero to two pi, so that could be also one dimensional embedding for such a space, right? But of course it's getting more difficult if you have these kind of objects that you cannot unfold. Okay, so today we mainly look at, at these things that you can unfold when basically for all of the data points, you can unfold them into a, into a 2D or 1D or into some Euclidean type of space. Okay, so there are some subtleties that, that one needs to be sure you understand. So for example, let's say you take the MNIST digits. Yeah, I mean, how can you be sure that there's not something like this happening, right? And then you apply a nonlinear dimensionality reduction to it and you might be surprised that the results are very bad. But the reason could be that there are like circular structures that you just cannot unfold. Okay. And um, yeah, what, what circulars, how could you get a circular structure, by the way, with the MNIST digits? Um, you could take an MNIST digit and you rotate it, right? You, you make one round of the MNIST digit. This gives you images of an eight. And of course, like the, the eight that is like on the side doesn't look very much like an eight anymore. It more looks like an infinity sign. But if you do the full rotation, it corresponds to a full rotation or to a, to a closed line in the high dimensional image space. Okay, so if you rotate an eight and have a, a full round, basically you're having such a closed loop in an image space. Okay, and for example, if you have a picture of a hand, I, I rotate it and do it the full round. Basically, that is also making a closed circle in the higher dimensional space. And I won't be able to embed that in a lower dimensional space if I'm not taking care of chopping it or cutting it at some point, right? So it's a difficult problem. And you could imagine in higher dimensions, even more complicated topological stuff could be going on. However, we will look at it very in a very simple way. So we are assuming that kind of we can kind of unfold our data set into something flat. Okay, so we look at a simpler case. Good, so far so good. This is the classical example. This is the so-called Swiss roll data set. So basically this is now our manifold from which we could sample and the samples they are now all these little crosses um, and they are colored now basically by the angle Right, so we want to visualize this inside out and we do it by giving it the color. It's basically how you generate the data, right? So you generate numbers from zero to three pi. Yeah? And then after pi, you are up here. After two pi, you are down here. And after three pi, we are up here. And you have to change the radius 
according also to this number from zero to two pi. I can show you how to generate such a data set. And then basically you can sample from it and you color it for the reason that when you find a two dimensional embedding, you see right away whether you did a good job or not. If all the colors are completely mixed up, yeah, then you know that you didn't fulfill this neighborhood relationship. However, when I see that the red points are close to the other red points, then I can see just by looking at the image that the embedding worked and that they preserved the neighborhood relationships. Okay. Okay, so far so good. Um, I can also show you how to generate the data set since I'm at again fun with some programming here. So this is now the, the, the latest notebook. I tell you about MDS later, but here comes the Swiss roll. So this is the Swiss roll thing. And so how do you generate it? Basically, uh, um, the, the way to, to do it, you are sampling um, uniformly from a two dimensional sheet of paper, right? So you have two coordinates and you uniformly sample from it. And then you do the nonlinear transformation to roll it up. So, and how do I roll it up? Um, first of all, I scale these numbers from zero to one. I scale them to three times pi, right? Since I want to have one and a half round, that's how it was on the image. And then I take the first coordinate and say, this is now the radius of the points. Okay. And at the same time, I'm using the first coordinates and feed it into cosine and sine. And then they generate me the coordinates that go in a circle. And by multiplying it also with these changing radius, I'm getting a spiral. Okay. And now for the second coordinate, or in this case, it's the third coordinate, I'm just taking the second coordinate of the Z. So this is giving me a uniform sample in the other direction. Yeah. And, and that's it basically. So if you, if you look at it, so this is exactly how this data was generated. And now what about the color? So the color that I used here is just this Z of zero. So that is just the, the true underlying first coordinate of the data. There are some subtleties here. This evenly sampled. There are some weird things. So why take the square root of all these sets? The reason being, um, it's just a hack. I'm not sure whether square root is correct, but it looks correct. I want to have as many points densely sampled as I have out here. However, in, in principle, if I wouldn't do it, I would have much fewer points here in this red region because it's kind of spread out further. And for that reason, I'm kind of nonlinear transforming the data before the transformation with the square root function here. But I found this function just by playing around with it. So maybe there's a correct version to do this. Okay, that it's really exactly uniformly on this shape. I don't know. I didn't want to spend too much time on this. Okay, so that is where the data comes from. Okay, and typically that's what nature is doing, right? So we say there are some variables, some underlying variables like these variables Z. Yeah, and they are kind of the parameters, the tuning things, but then nature, which could, for example, be my hand. So I can have a rotation and I can have it open and close two numbers. Okay. And I can randomly sample from them and show you a lot of images. And then these images, since I'm having two parameters open and close and rotation, they lie on a two dimensional manifold in the very high dimensional image space of the camera. Okay. And now the task would be to recover those two dimensions that are kind of describing the hand in a, in a useful way. And that's basically what these methods are doing that we will look at today. Good. So this is a super important Swiss roll data set. Of course, if you run linear um, PCA on it, if you do usually PCA, you will get three coordinate axes, right? Because it has like variance in three axes. But we see that when we have the right rotation and if we could unfold it, then kind of we could recover all the data like in their original parameters. Actually, even that is how it was generated, right? As I said, there are lots of different methods. Um, I think I list them here only until 2010. There may, must be many more. A famous one that is very commonly used is this TSNE, also called TSNP. So that's the method which is typically in all toolboxes and it works very well. And I'm sure if you understand the lecture today, you're also able to understand TSNE. So basic idea is, one question or one wish you could have is that you stay close with your friends, right? But the other wish that you could have as a data point is that you stay far away from your enemies. So and you can have both. So you, you want to be far away from everyone that's far away in the high dimensions and you want to be close to your friends. And I think this TSNE is finding a good compromise between those two goals that you could have, okay? 
And it's so it's more sophisticated than the stuff that we see today. So this a uh, lot of discussion was was started with two very important papers that both appeared in this in a single issue of Science. So there were independent researchers Josh Tenbaum, Vin De Silva, and John Langford, and another group of people, um, Sam Rovice and Lawrence Saul, um, who came up with two different solutions to this nonlinear dimensionality reduction problem. And I'm just wondering where are they sitting? And actually, so, okay, so the left-hand side paper is a group from Stanford University. So that's West Coast, USA. And the other group is here from the Gatsby unit in London. So they're really on different continents. Of course, they know each other. They were all part of the machine learning um, uh, community at that point. And people were talking about nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods and all of these kind of things. But they came up with independently with two methods which were both kind of successful and which are both useful and shed some light on different approaches how to solve this problem. And um, by this kind of publishing in science, of course, you have a very wide reach of people. So this is read by biologists, this is read by physicists, and everyone has data in high dimensions. So, so now if you have a nice toolbox and a nice easy method, then everybody will try your method and you get lots of citations. So the ISOMAP paper as of December 2021 got 15,000 citations. So there are researchers who during their whole career might have only 6,000 citations or something. And this paper, this single paper was cited incredibly often. Of course, George Tenenbaum was like, I guess he was at that point a PhD student. By now, he already has 75,000 citations on his papers. So he's like really a, a big shot in the field. So he's doing the combination where he's trying to, so he's also doing psychology. And so he's trying to explain like psychological phenomena with Bayesian, Bayesian inference and these kind of things. And he's doing many, many more. So he's really like a super interesting guy doing interesting work. And I think John Lankford was his supervisor at that point. And then there's Sam Rovice, who unfortunately passed away 10 years ago. So he also has 38,000 citations, where most of them now coming from his LLE paper. So he, he's also, he was a super gifted guy. And when you find some videos from Sam Rovice on YouTube, have a look at them. So he, he was really a very entertaining teacher. So really a great person. To, to have lectures with and to, to hang around with actually as well. And again, Lawrence saw then his supervisor at that point, if I'm not mistaken, or some co-worker of him. And they gained a lot of attention through these two papers. So now, um, why is that? So why were those two methods so super successful? So what, what's happened here? So what is the, the key here? So there are some things about these methods that are very important. So they are kind of easy to use, yeah, more or less. I was struggling a bit with LLE when I was re-implementing it, but in principle, they are easy to use. And they are also easy to understand that it's not just a black box method where you don't know what's going on. But after this lecture, you know why they work, okay? And you know the idea. In particular, you know when they fail, what you need to check, okay? So you really get an understanding of it. They made the code immediately freely available for download. So there's a website that you can go to and you can download MATLAB code in this case. And um, they have almost no parameters. So they really fit to the data and that's it. So there, there's not so much to tweak, which is not completely true. So you have to choose the right hyperparameters to get a good solution. Um, they showed some super inspiring example where you really said, wow, like the thing with the hand opening and turning around thing. So that's like something where you immediately can relate to with these images and where you then are surprised that the method can find out about these two dimensions of the data. And of course, they publish it very high ranked and get a lot of attention. So you should do this with your works, okay? So those are things that we can learn from these papers, okay? How you should think about stuff, how you could, should publish your stuff. Make it as easy as possible, the, the inventions that you have. Don't publish it when you barely understand it and everything is super complicated. Try to boil it more longer until it's chewable and then it's, it's easier to understand. So here's one interesting data set that they considered. So they had a computer graphics people generating like these face images from them for them. And this is basically like a, a 3D scan of an image. I think it's from a statue or something where they were able to change the lighting, which is one dimension and they could change the angle left and right and so on. And now with this ISOMAP paper, they were able to feed in the images 
and then extracting three axes where the one axis is now this long one, the other vertical one, and the third axis is shown here with a little slider on each of the images. So somehow the image, the data set is quite complex, like it's living like in a, in a thousand dimensional space, but they know how it was generated. There were three parameters of the renderer that was generating these images and they were able to recover this information by looking at the data, right? So they are kind of, um, in an unsupervised way, recovering the parameters that kind of determine these images. And this is of course super fascinating. That is something that every scientist wants to do with her data, right? I mean, you, you really want to figure out the underlying um, mechanisms behind your data, what how your data was generated, what were the factors that are influencing the data. Here's another one, of course, the omnipresent MNIST data set needs to be processed as well. And it's interesting to see what you get out. So somehow it's about the bottom loop articulation and the top arc articulation. So those are like a, a 2D representation of these, of these digits. That's not something that they put in that they were looking for that. It's more that they looked for a two dimensional embedding of the data and then they interpreted it by looking at the images. So what did it find? Okay, and then they found these things. So here's an um, image from the LLE paper. So this, those are um, real images. I guess from a video that you film from a person that changes their facial expression on a neutral background, or at that point, at that time, typically face images were like that so that you don't have a background so that you only see the, the heads. And so basically you see that it was a movie, maybe also by, you can go along these points here and this is like cha slowly changing the image, but it's interesting that it found like these different dimensions of smiling and of turning the head and of all of these things. So this is very unstructured data and it's surprising that you can find a low dimensional embedding of this. Okay, so that's that's really nice. Okay, so how do they work? So both methods, they basically use neighborhood graphs. Yeah, they're also called proximity graphs. That's the thing that Bob's like Alice and Kim, okay? So that's basically neighborhood graphs. So mathematically speaking, given a data matrix, again, here the data points are columns, yeah? we get a graph by saying now all the data points are vertices and we draw an edge between neighbors that mean by close by points. So points that are close by, I draw an edge and points that are far further away, I don't draw an edge, okay? It's like the same as a social network, all of these things, just a graph. Examples of graphs that you can implement are for example, the k-nearest neighbor graph, k and n graph abbreviated where you typically say, I want to be, I measure the Euclidean distance to all other data points and I'm taking the K closest. And this is kind of capturing this mathematical definition of a manifold that locally you are Euclidean space. Okay, so for your, what's local is now defined by the K in choosing the number of neighbors. So that is defining what's local and being a Euclidean space kind of says, I make an edge to all of those points where it makes sense to talk about Euclidean distance. Right, points that are further away, they might be on a different fold of my manifold and maybe it doesn't make sense to ask, talk about Euclidean distance. It only makes sense for close by points, okay? Of course, K is the parameter now here. That's a hyperparameter and depending on the choice, you get different solutions. So K equals zero means everyone is super lonely, nobody has friends, okay, or nobody has neighbors. So that's basically a graph without any edges. If K is equal to N, or maybe n minus one to be precise. Um, in that case, everybody is neighbor of everyone else. And it basically means if you would do an embedding for those, you cannot change anything because when you change one point then the distances to all other points will change. So you cannot really nonlinear transform anything if you take K to be all data points. So the sweet spot is somewhere in between where basically the neighborhood that is defined by the K is capturing basically these local neighborhoods that corresponds to this local, local linear space, so the tangent space kind of thing, okay? Then there's an alternative, the so-called epsilon graph, so also super simple. Basically you say my neighbors are those that are closer than epsilon, okay? That's it. And of course, epsilon here is another parameter. And you could again ask epsilon being equal to zero means everyone is alone. Epsilon being equal to infinity means everyone is a neighbor. So there's an interesting, so which one should you use? So both have their merits and both have their disadvantages. So the epsilon of course depends on the scale of your data, right? So suppose you say epsilon being one centimeter, right? But then you are blowing up your data set by scaling up the data 
and then the graph will change. This won't happen for the k nearest neighbor graph. So the k is independent of um, the scaling of your data, okay, which is a nice property. Um, however, sometimes the epsilon graph might be also good because it kind of may ensures that you are ensured that you, are, you catch a certain neighborhood around you. So that could be something useful in some applications. Good, so now what is the basic idea of isomap? The basic idea of isomap is um, start with this Swiss roll data set, for example, and then define a graph which is going along the manifold, right? So a graph which is kind of capturing the local neighborhoods along the manifold, and then you're calculating the geodesic distances between all data points. So visually that means um, if you have two points on the Swiss roll, uh, Let's take a one-dimensional Swiss roll, and I want to calculate the distance between those two points. I go along the graph, where the graph is also going along this manifold, okay? And um, here it's approximately the Euclidean distance, but if I have this point and that one, the Euclidean distance might be close, but if I would go along the graph, the geodesic distance, it will be large. And you see already where this is going. If this is the relevant distance going around here, there's no problem of unfolding it. Uh, let me also show you visually. So I have it in my notebook here. So, so this is now the graph. So where do I have, okay. So here you see now how the graph would look if we calculate such a neighbor graph. And here you have some shortcut, okay. So this is a bad one. So that basically means I, I had too many neighbors. So I should decrease the number of neighbors here maybe to nine. So let's generate the K and N graph. I still have it. So let's decrease it further. It's getting worse. Okay, so what am I doing? Oh, I'm resampling the whole thing the whole time. Okay, I shouldn't do that. So I should keep it constant. And uh, let's say I'm taking more data points. Okay, let me sample it again. Let's say 300, 400 data points, and now I'm, I'm looking for 10 neighbors. And then, then you can look at it and ideally, okay, now we don't have any shortcuts, okay? so. What you now see is that I have a graph which is going along the manifold, okay? Which is now, if I want to ask, what is the distance from this point to the point over here to the yellow one? The Euclidean distance would be quite close, but the distance along the graph would go all the way, find a path from one to the other. Like the, this graph is like a street map that you have, okay? And you really have to go through these things. You cannot beam yourself to another location. Another example would be you, have an, you are an aunt and you're sitting on a leaf on a tree, okay? And you want to move to another leaf. Typically what you have to do at being an aunt, you have to go back to the trunk and then you can go the other branch to the leaf. So the path could be very long along this structure and there could be, if you could jump or if you're a fly, then you can use the Euclidean distance, okay? So flies, they like Euclidean distances, aunts, they like geodesic distances, okay? Good, so far so good. Let me switch back to the slides. Is that right? Yeah. So the idea is that we calculate the geodesic distance along our manifold, and then we find a low dimensional embedding yeah, using multidimensional scaling. And then multidimensional scaling is like a magic, magic thing from, from your toolbox that turns distances into an embedding. Okay, that's basically MDS. We will explain it in detail. The idea of local linear embedding is slightly different. There what we are doing is we're taking for every data point, we kind of locally approximate the manifold. Yeah, think of it like estimating the span of the tangent space kind of at that location or um, find weights such that if you weight your neighbors, you can approximate the point. So you want to be like written as a weighted average of your neighbors, okay? and. Then you're looking for a low dimensional embedding elsewhere where this local structure that your neighbors with certain weights are approximations of you also holds, okay? So if you are along the manifold and you are the local, con local uh, combination of your neighbors, then also when you unfold it, the same thing will hold as well, okay? Or in this picture here, so suppose you are whatever, let's say you are a point up here, and you can be written as a, as a linear, look, linear combination of the points that are connected with you, yeah? then also in a two-dimensional bedding, the same will hold. Good, so this is isomap and LLE. 
So let's now make an algorithm out of isomap. So isomap, what do we have to do? First step, construct a neighborhood graph. That's the first step. And as you can see, you have to do some parameter tweaking. You have to choose K in such a way that you don't have shortcuts, right? So you don't want to have these short circuits there because you really, the aunt should go all the way. There shouldn't be a short shortcut for the aunt. Then you compute along this graph, all pairs shortest paths along the graph, which is another word for saying, calculate the distance matrix, which corresponds to the geodesic distances along the manifold. And then finally, having the distance matrix, you apply this magic trick MDS, multidimensional scaling, which is giving you an embedding, okay? Now the basic idea of LLE was that one. And so the algorithm LLE looks like this. You also construct a neighborhood graph. So that's very similar. Then you express the data points as local linear combinations of your neighborhood. And then you have to solve some eigenvalue problem to get this low dimensional embedding. Okay, so that's basically the structure of these methods. Let's start with isomap. So first of all, let's write down how to construct a neighborhood graph. So suppose this is your data matrix. You first calculate all Euclidean distances. Okay, so all real distances that you really have. However, then you make a list of your K neighbors or of your epsilon neighbors. So by this kind of you're saying, yeah, I know the Euclidean distance is not far away to the next fold from my Swiss roll. However, in my neighborhood, yeah, it's, it's, it's not part of my neighborhood, the other fold of the Swiss roll. So only the points that are close by are my real neighbors. And then you copy only the distances from your real neighbors, which are close by into a new matrix W. And basically now, okay, the W matrix is made like that. So you want to have zero distance to yourself and you want to have the, the Euclidean distance to your close by neighbors. And you say, I'm infinitely far away from everyone else. Okay. Now this W can be interpreted as a graph. Okay. By saying I have an edge if I don't have infinity. Okay, so basically then in each row, I will have, for example, for the K nearest neighbor graph, I will have K entries because I'm exactly looking at K neighbors, okay? That's by the way, also how these plots are made, okay? So when you look here at the code, I generate my data and then I have this function K and N graph, which gets all the distances and that is generating me such a matrix W. And then there's some magic function that where the code is elsewhere, where I'm having the locations and I'm having this weight matrix, okay, which contains infinity for the places where I don't want to have an edge, okay? And then you can generate these nice plots. Okay, so far so good. Question, is the W symmetric? Any ideas? So, any suggestions? Do you think it's symmetric, the W, yes or no? Some people say yes. Some people say, yeah. So as always, being a nice teacher, both of you are right. Yeah, of course, of course, which is impossible. So for the epsilon graph, for the epsilon graph, it's symmetric, right? So if you are epsilon far away from each other, then the other one is two. But with the K nearest neighbors, that's more like it is in life, right? Maybe um, you are the friend of someone, but the someone is not your friend. So it's not a symmetric relationship always, friendship. Okay, so now what does it mean for the... Like visually, how can this be? So suppose we have here a nice group of friends, okay? And for the three or two nearest neighbor graph, so this would be the two nearest neighbor graph, okay? That's like it is. However, there's some other person over here. Also, this guy gets like two friends, okay? But those two friends are now not his friends. So it's only going in one direction. So I could also draw... Um, edges or arrowheads on this one, okay? So you see it's not symmetric and so it could mean that in the W thing I'm having certain entries and everything is super symmetric but then there's this guy over here and he has entries which are not symmetric in the matrix because it's just in the i's row of W where I'm writing down the friends of this guy, okay? So it doesn't have to be symmetric. However, for the algorithm it doesn't matter very much. Okay, so typically these shortest path algorithms, they are kind of compatible whether we have a directed graph or whether we don't have a directed graph. 
we can symmetrize them also if we wanted to, right? We can just um, kind of average or average or we take the maximum of W and the other way around or something like this or minimum, yeah, something we need to think about, but it's not so super important. Okay, next we need to calculate now the all pairs shortest paths. And now from the wording, all pairs shortest paths, that looks something like something that you could look up elsewhere, right? I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be called like that. So that's like a classical graph algorithm problem. Yeah, there's the Dijkstra algorithm, which is calculating on a graph, the shortest connection between two points. That's exactly what your navigation, your GPS device in your car is doing all the time. It's always running Dijkstra, right? So it's looking for the shortest connection between two points on a map of Germany, for example. However, there's also a nice algorithm for the all pairs shortest path. And so there's a super efficient algorithm, which is kind of taking advantage of the fact that if I know already all the shortest paths for some subgraph, yeah, I can also now add a new point and get the shortest path without figuring everything out again in this subgraph. So just a new point can just connect here and get immediately the shortest path from the points in the cloud. So somehow, it's a um, dynamic programming problem in a way. So basically you can divide it into sub problems and by that find a clever solution. We don't have to reinvent the wheel here, which I wrote down here, but we look it up in a nice algorithms book like that one. So here it is. So the idea is basically implemented by the so-called Floyd Warshall algorithm, which is doing the following thing. So first of all, it starts of course with the edges that are there already in my WIJ. Those are already good paths that I have. However, there are lots of infinities in the W and the infinities means there's not a one edge connection between two points. That was the infinity meaning, right? I don't have a connection from point one to point 17 if there's an infinity in there. However, there might be now a path which I can, where I can connect two edges and then maybe I reach that point, okay? And so I have n steps for the algorithm. I first update all the lengths in D with respect to paths that are going via x1. So I could ask for two points, are you connected when you go via x1? Yeah, if yes, then now this will be your shortest connection. And then I need to check, is there yet another one for x2 and so on and so forth. And surprisingly, that's all you need to do. However, when you look at the implementation, you end up with three loops, okay? So basically you have to do the whole thing k times yeah, iterating over all the extra nodes that you can use for finding a new shortcut. And then you go K times over the whole matrix and checking whether you can improve any of the connections. So you compare the current connection that you have. Note, you don't have to store the connection. You don't only store how long it is, okay? So you check whether the connection that you haven't written down, but you know there is one, um, between i and j and you compare it with the connection that you first go to k and then from k to j. Okay, so that's basically if you find a better way then this will be the updated distance between i and j. And you could think that you only have to do this once but when you do it only once you are not reducing the information that you gained by the first pass through all the thing. And to get all of them one can show that you have to do this n times. Okay, so you have to iterate over the whole thing n times. Question. So, please ask. I have a question. So, is this is this algorithm computing the true distance? distance? Yeah, this thing will. I mean, in general, this is general uh, calculating also the distance for any graph that you give it. But of course, you're right. The the idea will be to feed it now our geodesic graph that is going along the manifold where you have these short connections to your neighbors and infinity for all the non-connected points. And then our Floyd Warshall algorithm will calculate now the distance matrices for all possible points. And the distances will go along the graph. And by this, we are then calculating the geodesic distances. However, the Floyd Warshall algorithm um, can be applied to any general graph. Okay. I guess that's also how Tenenbaum and colleagues came up with this idea. So they were paying close attention to all their computer science lectures, in particular also to the graph lectures, where this super fancy algorithm was. Um, presented and then they thought, man, we could apply to dimensionality reduction in our machine learning research. So let's try that, okay? okay thank you. Um, here's another version. So this is a version with three loops. And when you, when you run ISOMAP 
and do a do a profiler on it, it will tell you Floyd Warshall is taking up all the time. So this is an O of n cube algorithm, which is super expensive. And in NumPy, it's useful already if you can rewrite loops yeah, as vectorized operations. And you can do this, you can reduce it by having only two loops here and kind of using a vectorized operation on the minimum. And this is speeding up the whole thing, even though it's still n to the n cube, but because of um, the loops being so super slow, yeah, when you do it literally in Python, um, this implementation is now much faster. And if one of you finds a Floyd Warshall implementation vectorized or matrix wise, yeah, with only one loop, I'd be interested in it. I would include it into the code here too. I only found that one. I played around with, with one loop, but I couldn't get it to work quickly enough. Here's my classic MATLAB implementation, just the same code. Okay, so far so good. So we have point one, we can now calculate neighborhood graphs. We have point two, we can now calculate all pairs shortest path. And three is now missing. We need to do multidimensional scaling. So what is multidimensional scaling? Okay, for this, um, let me first have some words in a nutshell. MDS is solving the problem that given a distance matrix, yeah, recover a data matrix that matches those distances. Okay, so you start with the distance matrix and then you get um, something like that. So I show you some data that I think I copied it from a roadmap I found in my car. So here's a list of cities. Okay, those are all German cities. And this is basically this kind of distance table that you kind of find sometimes in old roadmaps, right? So I always still have a paper version in my car because I don't trust technology very much. So I really want to not get lost anywhere. So that's why I have a paper roadmap. And on the back of the paper roadmap, there are all these distances. For example, 545 kilometers, that's the distance between Aachen and Basel, okay? And so on and so forth. So the fifth line here will be all the distances of Dortmund to some other locations, okay? So I guess you are familiar with it. And now the magic trick that MDS is doing is take this table here yeah, and turn it into a map of Germany, okay? That's super fancy. I think this is super surprising that it works and it works very well. I mean, so here's Flensburg and Rostock. Okay, it's, it's mirrored, so I need to change the mirroring, but um, it's quite good. So here is Düsseldorf and down here is Stuttgart, Basel and Salzburg, München and Garmisch, Partenkirchen and so on and so forth. So that is MDS. MDS is taking the distance table from a roadmap and turning it back into a map, okay? Of course, the distances are in kilometers on the Autobahn. They are approximate Euclidean distances, so it's not exact, right? In principle, you could also generate such a map from taking the travel times. If you say the travel times are proportional to the distances, you could also take the travel times. Or you get a very funny, interesting 2D Embedding, for example, of cities in Germany that you that are connected by plane or by train or something. Good, so let's try to derive this method. So suppose we have a data matrix. Let's assume the mean is zero, right? The mean is arbitrary anyway. Moving around a map doesn't change the distances in it. So we can always assume that the mean is zero. Let's define the gram matrix. That's just now a repetition slide here. So the gram matrix was the one with the inner product. Then there's the covariance matrix, that's the one with the outer products, okay? And then there's the square distance matrix. Here the D is a square distance matrix. And that was the biggest challenge in my implementation things, that I kind of forgot which algorithms need the distances squares and which one does it not need squared. And that's something where you need to be careful. So let's look at it. So basically the entries are now the Euclidean distances between two data points. And that can be also written like this inner product, as we've seen already a couple of times. Great. So those are just names. Now here's multidimensional scaling, and we will go through the different points. First of all, we um, calculate the gram matrix G from our data matrix, and that is the magic, yeah, because somehow here are all these inner products. But how do you, so we know how we get from the gram matrix to the data to the distance matrix but it's kind of magic that you can do it also the other way around, okay? That you can go from the distance matrix to the gram matrix. 
that's kind of surprising to me. Once we did that, we calculating the eigenvector decomposition and by this getting kind of like a square root, a matrix square root of our gram matrix. And this matrix square root then will be exactly our data matrix, right? So if you multiply x transpose times x, you have exactly this equation and you get back the gram matrix. Okay, so the difficult step is getting from the um, distance matrix the gram matrices. Okay, so here are a couple of nodes. So the mean is arbitrary, of course, right? And also the data can be arbitrarily rotated. So that's all meaningless for the distances, right? So now, how can we calculate the gram matrix from the distance matrix? That is the puzzle that we need to solve here. So for this, we need this lemma, yeah? And this looks a bit horrible, okay? So let's first skip it. Here's the theorem. So here's the formula. So suppose we have a data set X with mean zero, then we can use this formula. You take the distance matrix and you multiply from the left, the centering matrix H, and from the right, the centering matrix H, then minus a half, and then this gives you the gram matrix, okay? So to me, this formula is super surprising, so I couldn't invent it. Um, however, when you write it out, this HDH, and now you use all the stuff from the lemmas from the previous page, you can show that this is indeed minus two times G. Okay, so let's go back to the lemma. So what do we need? So we need these things. So first of all, um, we need to understand that the square distances can be calculated from the gram matrix. Okay, so let's write this out. So the entry dij is written and can be written like these inner products. So we are basically multiplied out this definition of the distance, okay? I just wrote it now with inner products. And you can see, so for the i's row, I always need this norm of xi. And for the j's column, I always need the norm of the j's column, okay? Now I just need to translate this formula over here into a vectorized formula, which I did down here. Let's start with a simple thing here. So the entry dij depends on minus two times the inner product between x1 and xj. Those are exactly the entries of my gram matrix. Okay, so vectorizing the last bit here is the simplest one, it's just minus two times g. So now what about the other parts? So for this, let's have a look. So first of all, we need these entries of the gram matrix which live on the diagonal, right? So those are the ones that are on the diagonal, the one xi, xi. I get them by taking the gram matrix and dot multiplying it with the identity matrix. So where dot multiplication is just this component-wise multiplication, I'm basically zeroing out all the off-diagonal terms. And I'm just keeping our matrix where I'm still having the same diagonal entries, but everything else is zeroed out. And now this diagonal matrix is used to scale um, basically this vector over here. So by multiplying it from the right with the one vector, maybe let's do that on the board. Okay, so what's happening if I do this? So we are already happy maybe that we have the diagonal matrix. So let's call these things, uh, or let's call it uh, whatever. Uh, let's just write it out. So it's x1 x1 transpose and x2, x2 transpose. Okay, that's how the matrix looks after dot multiplying it, uh, so after Hadamard pro product with the identity matrix. Then we get this one, okay, so far so good. Now let's multiply it with the one vector. So what we get is row times column, row times column. So this thing will be exactly like um, a vector now. where I now put the diagonal into a column vector, okay? What we are doing here is we are doing like intuitive stuff, transforming the diagonal into a vector, and we are trying to write it all with matrix vector multiplication and matrix matrix multiplication, because when we, that's a very powerful language because it directly always translates into code, which is good. So now next thing, I need to multiply this with a one transpose vector. So let's do that. So this is a one transpose vector. Um, so now what is that doing? Basically now row times a row, so this is a row vector, right? So it contains a one and a one, and it's like having the outer product. So what I'm doing here is just copying it. 
into each of the rows. So row times column, row times column. Okay, so it's just a broadcasting type of thing. So I'm having it in a vector and now by multiplying it with the one vector, for example of size n, yeah, I can now broadcast it and get it getting an n by two vector in this case. Okay, so this is a way to write the broadcasting operations with matrices and vectors. Okay, again, the nice thing is when you can translate the NumPy expressions into this kind of notation, you can use matrix differential calculus to calculate arbitrary derivatives in this world, right? Which is super useful. Anyway, now what do I gain by this? Okay, that tells me now I'm having a matrix of the correct size when every row I'm having the same numbers, yeah, corresponding to the xi times xi. Let's look back what we wanted. We want to have for the ith row of D, I want to add the xi transpose xi. So this is exactly the matrix that I need, that I need to add to the expression. Now the xj, xj is exactly the other way around. So I just need to transpose this expression. Note that this is the diagonal matrix, so the transpose is the same. And I'm just moving the ones to the other side, okay? So for that reason now, this is an expression for my distance matrix here, written in a fancy way, okay? Good, second point. Again, as words, if I remove the mean from the so-called ones matrix, yeah, the result will be the zero matrix. Okay, that's not surprising, right? Because if you have the ones matrix, you have lots of ones in there. What is the mean of that one? It is the ones vector. So if I remove the, the ones vector from the ones matrix, I end up with the zero matrix, right? It's just like viewing the ones matrix as a data matrix. And then if I calculate the mean, it is just a single data point, the vector with all ones. And if I remove it, I get the zero matrix. However, we can also write it fancily in mass. So um, removing the mean is multiplying from the right with my centering matrix, okay? So if I do it, so this is the ones matrix, it's the outer product of two ones vectors. I use the definition of the H, which was like the identity matrix minus all these ones. So let's just plug it in. So the identity times the ones matrix is this ones matrix. And then here I'm getting um, one, and one and one transpose times one and one transpose. So this is the expression in the middle here. Now I'm putting the brackets very nicely. So putting the brackets around the middle term here, yeah. For these kind of calculations, you always have to make sure that the inner dimensions match for the matrix matrix multiplication. And if you calculate the inner product of a one vector with itself, you get an N, okay? And this N will cancel out with this one over here. So what you end up with is the vector one times the vector one transpose, which is exactly the thing from the front. And so the whole thing is zero. And of course, you can also do it from the other side and centering from the other side will also zero out the whole thing. Okay, so that is the second fact that you need to understand. Next fact, also super simple actually, assume that the mean of a data set is zero. Okay, that basically means that x times the one vector is equal to zero, yeah, where I omitted the one divided by n in this case. Um, then basically it means that if I remove it again, it stays zero. So if I apply the centering matrix to a data matrix that is already zero, I can plug it in here. Yeah, so, and the identity gives me an X and then I get X times the ones matrix. Now, um, how do I go about this stuff? Oh, then I know that X times one N is equal to zero. So I get a zero over here. And since there's one term zero, the whole thing gets zero and I end up with the X, okay? So far so good, by the way, with this, I'm showing that the centering matrix is idempotent, right? So if I apply it twice, the, the, the mean stays zero. So furthermore, we can have the following for in this situation, if the mean is zero and we write the gram matrix as X transpose X, if we have the transform gram matrix where we transform it, yeah, then it doesn't change the matrix. So it basically, it's obvious, right? If the data set is already where the mean removed, if you remove it from the gram matrix, 
you are not changing the gram matrix at all. So the gram matrix doesn't change. Great, let's use this stuff now for the proof. For this, let's plug in for the D matrix, our magic definition up here. Okay, let's plug it in for the D matrix and multiply from the left and from the right the H to each of the terms. Then let's start again with the simplest one. The last one, H times G times H is equal to G. Okay, great. Then <clears throat> this one over here, we know that H times the ones matrix is zero. Okay, great, so we can ignore it. Again, on the other side, there's also a zero, so we end up with the minus two G. Okay, and this is now proving our formula, which is super non-obvious, that you can take the data matrix, you center it from both sides, and you have the gram matrix. That's super surprising, yeah. Um, have a look at other expositions of multidimensional scaling, yeah. I haven't found one which is following this route, okay. I think this is kind of unique. If you find a reference for this matrix style derivation of MDS, please tell me, then I will put it on the slide. Okay, great, so we solved our problem. So we calculate the gram matrix using the distance matrix, okay. Then we apply the eigenvector decomposition and get a data matrix, a new data matrix, which is matching now our distances, okay. So that's MDS. Um, let's have a look at the demo. And I basically showed you already. So this is, um, I, do, I, do I have an implementation of this one? Oh, yeah, here's my MDS implementation. So it's, it's really doing just that. It's starting with non-squared distances and it's defining the centering matrix. And today computers are fast. I'm just writing it like this. There are more efficient ways actually to do it, right? So it's a bit wasteful to really generate the centering matrix, but it makes really nice code, right? So this code looks exactly like on the slide. And so we really can be sure that this is doing the right thing. However, they are more clever and more efficient way to remove the mean from a matrix from the right and to remove the mean from a matrix from the left. So you can also use some Python broadcasting tricks and have a short expression for that one, which is more efficient. Then we calculate the eigen decomposition using our LinAlg um, methods. And now we need to pick the last largest D eigenvalues. And there I also figured out some fancy expression in NumPy. You can do it like that. So I want to have them from the back D examples and I want to go backwards through them. So it's a fancy way of saying first flip the lambda and take the first K elements. So that's a one stop solution to that one. So it's the same as first flipping the lambda and taking the first elements. You can also index by minus one and start from the back somehow. But it took me a while to figure that one out. And you can do the same for the matrix and then you just calculate the matrix square root with that one and get the data. Okay, if you apply this in the um, in our demo example, so let's run the code again. So that is the data from the city. So that was my playing around with the indices. So if you do this, um, you get this plot. And from this plot, you see you need to rotate and do some transformations to it to really get a map of Germany. And I think here's a minus sign missing. So let's try it again. Let's show the same thing and we get a nice map of Germany. Okay. Which is super cool. I, I, I really like it. I think it's quite nice with the roadmap. Um, okay, great. So let's back to where we were. So now you know what MDS is. Okay. It's a really nice method. Let's summarize isomap. So isomap is constructing a neighborhood graph, calculates geodesic distances along the graph and then applies MDS to the distance matrix to find an embedding. Okay, so that's it, that's isomap. Um, let me show you a quick demo. So for this, we have the Swiss roll data. Um, by the way, when you write code, make sure you are writing test code. So otherwise it's not possible. You have to debug your distance matrix, okay, your implementation. So I have an implementation in the ML solution one, which I don't show you because I think it's part of the exercises, but you should debug it. So create a simple data set. So what is my data set here? It's just a data set one dimensional, which is like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Why is so simple? Because I know the distances between the numbers are just plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and so on. So I calculate here the, um, the distances here. Okay, and I can, with one view, I can see that the distances are correct. 
Of course, it's not checking all bells and whistles of the distance function, whether it works in higher dimensions or not, but it's already some check. You might wonder what this what is function is. So that's like a super simple, um, super simple thing. So I just implemented some function that takes an expression string, prints the expression into equal sign, and then it evaluates the expression. Yeah, that's just super convenient to have like nice output, right? Then I can, I can just read off here, distances of x is equal to this, okay? And then next, I have an implementation of the k and n graph, and I check it with super simple data set where I can do it in my head for two neighbors so that I'm sure that it's doing the right thing. So here it is. So k and n graph on this data set is you're always neighbor to the left and to the right hand side. And the first data point is to the first two followers. Okay. And the other entries are all infinity. And if you take four nearest neighbors, like the diagonal gets larger. Okay. And you can also look for epsilon graphs, 0 0.5, everyone is lonely. 1.1, now you have your neighbors. And with 2.1, you have like more neighbors. Okay. So it's important to have this kind of debug code and to, to write this test code when you implement it along the way. Otherwise, there's no chance. There are too many possibilities where it can go wrong. Good. Then there's the Floyd Warshall algorithm, which I showed you on the slide. You can just copy and paste it. And also here I'm looking, I want to see whether there are still infinities missed, right? If I have infinities in here, then my approximation didn't work very well. So I was using this code also to figure out the solution for two loops. And I figured out that one loop was always failing the, the attempts that I made. Okay, so that's another way that is important. So here, something that you should look at is symmetric or not, or are there still some infinity? So it looks like there's still some bugs or something wrong here. By the way, why are there some bugs? So that's bad. Okay, yeah, I have to, I have to figure that one out, whatever. So there's still something wrong. So here comes the Swiss roll, great. Some code for plotting the graph. Okay, so now here we have a nice Swiss roll along the graph and then comes the isomap implementation, which are just these lines of code that I showed you. And um, I could show you the embedding and the embedding then looks like this. Okay. And now this is a two dimensional embedding. So it's the output now of the isomap. You get like Y1 and Y2 and I'm using the colors for my variable Z. Okay. And by this, I immediately see, wow, this works very well. I mean, when you look at the manifold here, um, you see that sometimes there are some holes, right? Up here, there are some holes. Of course, those are harder to catch correctly, right? So there are close by points where you don't have connection with and you're kind of taking detours and trying to find an embedding for those, which might not even exist. But overall, it's, it's working very nicely. Of course, let's see what's happening if we would have shortcuts, okay? Maybe a thousand data points is a bit too much. So let's take 500 and let's see whether we get shortcuts, any shortcuts. No, no shortcuts, but we have this, it's like broken there. It's like very open. So let's see how the embedding looks like. Ah, it didn't work. Okay. It looks like there's some other technical problem. Ah, no, this is very bad. So, okay. This is demo time. Demo time is not always working. Um, there could be many reasons. Let's create a graph with some shortcuts. No, still no shortcuts. So let's have more of them. So let's create more. Okay, now, now we are getting some shortcuts, but not enough. Ah, I want to have more shortcuts. Okay, let's just take fewer data points. And let's take here, maybe by the way, we should call this k, k being equal to 20, and then also use for the isomap the same. So now we have something that is messed up. Okay. So this has shortcuts. Let's see what the isomap embedding is. It can't really do it, right? Because it's still connected at these things where it's like crossed. So this guy is connected to the yellow ones over here with shortcuts. That's why you cannot unfold it. Okay, great. So that is basically the summary of um, isomap. That's it. Isomap is super simple idea. You make a graph along the manifold generate a distance matrix, and then you use this roadmap, these paper roadmap algorithms going from the distances to a map. Okay, so that's it. Let's continue with the other method, LLE. So this is a sketch from um, Rowweiss and Sol's paper. 
So first of all, first step, you select neighbors and look at this one here. This is not a food. This is like a symbol for we are in high dimensions. Yeah, I think this is quite pretty choice. So I think that's I should copy it. That's nice. You have a single data point. You pick the neighbors, which are like a little bit more grayish. Maybe you can see it. And then you're trying to represent the, the data point as a linear combination of the neighbors. And this is like making edges to your neighbors. So you're saying, I want to be the linear combination with the weights in my matrix W of my neighbors. And then you look for an embedding in a lower dimensional space. That's why the foot is gone. Yeah, where the relationships to my neighbors is still the same. Okay, so that is the whole idea. So those are the steps. So we need to select neighbors. Let's take the k nearest neighbors, why not? Then we need to find all these weights for each data point. So we could also write it as an optimization problem. We are looking for weights W, where my entries W are only allowed where I'm a neighbor, everything else is zero. Okay, such that I can reconstruct my data basically from its neighborhoods. Okay, and then I find a low dimensional embedding where the same neighborhood relationships are fulfilled. Okay, let's see how we can solve it. First, finding the weights. Um, we have a constraint optimization problem and by now we are experts in it, right? So let's write it down. We want to minimize this guy. Subject to the wij is equal to one um, when we sum them all up. Okay, um, this can be written in another way. Um, first of all, notice we can solve this problem for each row separately. So we don't have to simultaneously solve this for the full matrix W, but we can take the 17th data point and can try to find the W for the 17th data point. So we can do it separately for each data point, which is giving us a simpler problem here. Okay, let's continue. Let's rewrite the objective. First of all, um, the W summation of the W should be equal to one. So we can drag in the X into this weighted summation. So we could also say it's a weighted summation of the WJ times the differences. Okay. It's like saying I'm writing this one in front of the X and then I'm combining these two sums. Then I can rewrite this outer product, this summation here, I can rewrite it as an inner product between these two vectors. Okay. Um, and this is basically now can be written as a matrix C. Okay, so this is basically now a kind of covariance matrix thing. I can drag out the W even further. So the whole thing here can be written as W transpose times some matrix times W. Okay, so this might ring a bell already. So if I want to minimize this guy, it's like minimizing this guy. And this is like solving an eigenvalue problem, right? I mean, this is like multiplying from the left and right some vector, find the eigenvector with the smallest eigenvalue. However, not exactly. For the eigenvalues, the constraint would have been that the norm of W is one. However, not the L2 norm. Here it's the L1 norm. So this is a different problem. So this is not an eigenvector problem, but it looks similar. Let's write down the Lagrangian. So basically writing the objective minus lambda, my constraint. Okay, I can calculate the derivative as usual. And I get this equation, basically. I get an equation for W that is C inverse times the ones vector. Okay, and I can see that this can be calculated, right? So this can be, can be done. So I can calculate the C from my data set and I calculate the inverse of it and apply it to the one. However, in practice, Typically we solve this. So there's a method in NumPy called solve. I think linalg.solve where you can feed it in a C matrix and you give it a ones vector and then it will spit out a W. And it's doing it in a more efficient way than calculating the inverse matrix. So once I've solved that one, it's underdetermined still, I need to enforce the norm of those. And that's just by normalizing the W with its length, okay, or with its sum. Good, so here's the summary. So how do we find now the weight vector for a single data point? First, I find the nearest neighbor of the single data point. Then I'm calculating this local covariance matrix. And it's weird that it's called covariance matrix because it's using inner products, but it is in some way a covariance matrix as well in some other space. And so it makes sense to call it like that, but it's a bit disturbing. 
and then we define the weights according to this solve solution here. Good, when we have them for each data point, now we can put them into one big matrix and collect all of them. And that will be the solution to the overall problem that we're trying to solve. So now, given the matrix W, how do we find an embedding? So the embedding means now we find new coordinates Y where we have the same relationships between data points. So the W is kind of our graph, our graph information, who's our neighbor and, and how close am I to, it, to them, right? That it's in the way it's some of this information. And we are looking for an embedding Y where the Y is the data matrix directly such that the mean is zero and we can ask for an arbitrary covariance in this case. So we ask for a unit covariance. So this can be all written also in fancy ways. So this objective can be written, I, have, um, I haven't spelled it out, but it can be written as Y times M times Y transpose with these constraints. And the matrix M is basically can be written as identity matrix minus W and so on and so forth. So I'm putting some of the details here under the carpet and I'm not expecting you to do those, but actually it's not really difficult. I just don't explain it for time reason actually as well, but it can be done. And I think it's fine for you if you are also fine with that you also think it can be done, that if you have enough time and a whole afternoon or a whole week, you could work it out, okay? And then it can be shown that this is very much similar to the PCA problem actually that I omitted in, and I put into the appendix where I'm simultaneously trying to find several directions. However, it can be solved by an eigenvector procedure. So this is the whole algorithm which I copied from um, Sam Rovai's page, so it's still there. And there are all the different steps now detailed, let's say as pseudocode. And he says, after calculating this matrix M, you have to find the eigenvectors for the smallest eigenvalues and those are your solutions, okay? So let's see whether that's really true. I tried to implement it and it took me very, very long to get it running, so it was super painful. So I was following really closely the instructions. First, find nearest neighbors. Second, solve the reconstruction weights. And then third, compute the embedding coordinates and I had a very hard time to implement it, okay? So why is that? First of all, because I had always bugs in here. So I had stupid bugs like this, not assigning like the first, a certain row, but I was assigning all of the rows with some stuff and so on and so forth. So there were many things that were kind of wrong in the code. The other things is there are some tricks here now, some regularization tricks. So it looks like if the number of neighbors is larger than the dimensions I'm living in, it looks like my matrix C that I want to kind of solve for is like really in a bad shape, okay? So I need to regularize it and add something to the diagonal. So how did I come up with this super brilliant idea? I came up with it by looking at the code of Sam Rovice himself. So he has it still on, their web, on his website. And this code is nicely written. And if you really want to re-implement it and the slides don't work, Sometimes you have to look into the original code. And there was this kind of hint that if this K is larger than the D, you need to regularize, okay? However, that wasn't before in my slides and I thought that's not necessary and I've overlooked it. So maybe I should look back into the science paper, whether it's in the science paper. I guess it's in one of the footnotes or something. And I guess for people from the, with the capabilities of Sam Rovice, it's probably obvious that you have to do it sometimes, these kind of things. Unfortunately for me, it wasn't obvious. But that's just how, how the experience could be. So you play around with it and you cannot get it to work and then suddenly you kind of get the solution. So now how could you find something brilliant like that yourself? First of all, with a lot of patience. So don't expect the code that you write to work immediately, but always be prepared that it might take some time to get it working and then Put some print statements in here, right? So visualize the stuff that you're doing. Some other statements that I put in here which helped me was, okay, I have a graph, so let's plot it, right? So I said plot graph x, w. I think I need to do it like this. And so I was running the LLE code and then looking at the graph after this operation here. 
And by that, I was catching the bug that I had a colon over here and not an I, okay? And so you have to go through step by step. And that's why it's also so important that you understand the method that you are implementing step by step, because then you are able to implement it. Otherwise, it's super hard. Good, so luckily we had this code here and um, I was able then to translate it. Let's look at the results. Uh, the results are in here as well. Where is it? Yeah. Um, so we also apply to the Swiss role. This is just for checking that I don't have too many shortcuts or that I have no real shortcuts. And then if I get the embedding, I'm getting also nice two dimensional embedding. And this kind of works, right? So there must be a sweet spot where this looks better. And what is the sweet spot? It could be because my sampling is not uniform enough, or it could be that I didn't have enough data points, or it could be that my K was not very good, or it could be that my eigensolver is not very good at small eigenvalues. There's a discussion on the page of Sam Rovice for the algorithm where he discussed that MATLAB changed the eigensolver at some point and then his method didn't work anymore. So the LLE thing is a bit more sensitive to these kind of numerical things. And I think the reason is that we are looking at the eigenvector for the smallest eigenvalues, okay? So that looks like something tricky, okay? Where you need to be really careful that you got the right thing and that you have a good solver. Nonetheless, I like the method a lot because it's kind of a, a, a related but another take on this idea of having like a local local linear space on a manifold and then capturing that like with an algorithm and with a numerical method. So that's why I like it as well. So far so good. Five minutes left. We have another method and I show you just the gist of it, right? That there are many other ways to do this and this is maximum variance unfolding. And this is nice because it's back in the idea of maximizing the variance, okay? However, in PCA, we are looking for a straight line, like for the, like a 1D subspace, for example, that maximizes the variance. This is about variance unfolding, okay? So how does it work? So the instructions is try to unfold the manifold by keeping the local distances constant and maximizing everything else. So that means basically, if this is your data set, you're kind of maximally unfolding it. And now I can drag and drag and drag. Like locally, I'm still connected here. Yeah, I cannot tear it apart. And that's how I can unfold it. And no matter how my manifold look like, if my manifold is looking like this, and now I'm doing the maximum variance unfolding thing, I'm getting bad the sheet of paper, okay? However, of course, in this representation, you need to make sure that you don't have shortcuts between different layers, okay? So the locality must be preserved in, in this folded version here, okay? Good, so how can you mathematically formul formulate it? Construct a neighborhood graph, and then you solve a semi-definite programming problem. So what is the semi-definite programming problem? That is one other fancy method from the optimization people, right? Who invented many situations where you wouldn't, where you are surprised that you can numerically find a solution. And the semi, excuse me, the semi-definite programming problem is yet another one. So, but let's first formulate it, what we wanted to do. Maximize the variance. So find an embedding Y, okay, such that the variance is maximized. So that is a fancy way to calculate the variance. As you know, the variance can be calculated by measuring the distance to your sample mean, yeah? But the variance can be also calculated by calculating the distance to everyone else, okay? Actually, there's a curious formula, which I don't write down, but so the variance is basically your average distance to your other points in your data set. That's also another description of the variance, okay? So that's another way to calculate it. So what about our constraints? Our constraints are that if xi and xj are neighbors, they could be k nearest neighbors, they could be epsilon neighbors, then I want to have distances to be preserved, okay? So I'm maximizing the distances between everyone here, but between my neighbors, I want to keep the distances. And this could be like visually seen like um, you're having a point cloud and you are drawing little strings between your neighbors. So you're really putting literally strings from you to your neighbors. And then you kind of 
undragging the whole thing and trying to unfold the thing, but keeping the string connections. Okay, it's like having a big, um, yeah, a big network or something with lots of strings, and you can put it together and you can put it out. And that is basically what the optimization problem is doing. Then I can always ask that the embedding should have mean zero. Okay. This problem, unfortunately, is not a convex problem because the side condition here is also a squared side condition. So it's a non-convex problem. So your this is something like an, an, um, an ellipse defining as an ellipse, right? That you want to maximize in an ellipse subject to some other elliptical constraint, okay? Since it's also something with squares here. And that is non-convex problem. However, we can reformulate the whole thing by writing it in terms of the gram matrix. So the short story is, instead of optimizing over the Y, we are optimizing over some gram matrix. And once we find the gram matrix that fulfills all of this, okay, we can do our trick to get back like an MDS from the gram matrix a data embedding. Okay, so that's basically the idea. Now comes a lot of rewriting business and a lot of magic like matrix stuff, okay? I wrote it all out for you here, but I think I'm I'm not going into full detail. Yeah, maybe a little bit of detail. So if my mean is zero for my data, then I can say something about my gram matrix. Then basically the sum of all entries in my gram matrix is equal to zero. That's something that we can show. Um, then we can also rewrite all the distances using the entries in the gram matrix. That's again the same trick that we've seen before, okay? So it's just the inner product of xi with xi and xj with xj. And this is basically two times xi times xj, okay? And then using these tricks, we can rewrite the objective function that this variance here can be also written as 2n times the trace of the gram matrix, surprisingly, okay? Which is nice. Um, and we can rewrite all other stuff. We can rewrite again our distances with some fancy formula. And we can then also rewrite our objective function using some, some square distance trick. Anyway, at the end, we end up with this problem. We are maximizing the trace of the gram matrix and we are optimizing over the space of matrices. So we now have a problem where we are not optimizing over numbers, we are not optimizing over vectors, but we are optimizing over gram matrices, okay? And we want one which has the largest possible trace. However, the distances as expressed by the gram matrix are constrained to be the distances that I have in my folded way, okay? So that's another way to write the distances in this space of Y. And then the summation of all entries should be zero, that corresponds to the constraint that basically the mean is zero of the data. And then I have this notation here where please notice this is not the usual greater or equal, but this is a curved one, okay? So it's, it's not like that. It's like this, okay? You might have seen it. And that is the notation that says the matrix G is positive semi-definite. Okay, so this notation is for positive semi-definiteness. And that is like a constraint which is, for me, very hard to think about it. So now how do you write a computer program to solve this? So this is kind of fancy. However, it is solved. It's a solved convex problem. And you can look into the book from Stephen Boyd and look it up. Or you can download an algorithm for this that solves this. Okay. And this is called semi-definite programming, where you now also know why it's called semi-definite programming, because you have a semi-definite constraint on the matrix that you're optimizing on. Okay, that's why the whole thing is called semi-definite programming. And it has lots of variables, right? If you have a thousand data points, this thing will have one million variables to optimize over. Okay, so it is expensive. But it can be solved in an efficient way and it will solve basically the maximum variance unfolding problem. But I'm not going into more detail. I just wanted to show you that by clever intuition, yeah, this one here, starting with the optimization problem, keep the local distances constant, maximize the variance, and then combining this with clever notations, you can end up with a solvable optimization problem. Okay, 
As a summary, there were a couple of words of today. Yeah, this is a weird summary. But now you should know what a manifold is, at least the computer science knowledge that you need, right? And you should know what the Swiss row data set is when you see it. And all these other things, these proximity graphs, K and N graphs, and all the other things, you should now understand the difference between Euclidean distance and geodesic distance. And you should also understand how these methods work, right? When in particular, you should know how the isomet method works because that's the one that you should implement. The LLE thing is also curious, but in my tests, it's a bit more fragile with, with the outcome and with the numerics in here. Or maybe I'm not a numerics person to really, to really handle it. So that's more tough. So to me, the isomet method is simpler. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks a lot. And I see you on Monday. Bye-bye.